When you view an Infotech's webinar or movie, you do so with four caveats. First, you are agreeing to the terms posted at the webpage listed on this slide. Second, our lawyers want you to know that what Infotex presents is often time-dated or about new trends, regulations, or guidance, and therefore we cannot provide this material with any warranty whatsoever. Thirdly, material provided with Infotex webinars and movies is copyrighted. You keep the copyright to material customized to your organization, but Infotex reserves the right to use the material in other engagements and boilerplates. See our transfer of copyright agreement at the webpage listed in the slide. Finally, those who view our webinars or movies may be added to an email mailing list. If you do not wish to receive notice of additional educational opportunities, please accept our apologies and please opt out at the webpage shown on the slide. Hey, Dan Hadaway here, introducing our next webinar. On my way into work this morning, it was six degrees below zero. And it occurred to me, because I knew I had to introduce the webinar, that maybe we should get out in front of our office building. So this is our, we have a garage in our office. And whew, the reason why is because if we don't pay attention to what we need to do from this webinar, we could be left out in the cold. And I get the honor of introducing somebody in this presentation today. I, I've been doing the R7 article and then the movie for years and years now. And, and 2022 is the year I get to hand it over to Adam Reynolds, our lead non-technical auditor. Uh, who has a wealth of information, wealth of knowledge about the risks that community-based banks face. And so this is our annual movie. It's meant to help information security officers of small uh, community-based financial institutions uh, present the top risk that the bank faces to their board of directors. And so we envision that maybe you bring up parts of this or maybe you ask us for the PowerPoint and you just craft it down to what you wanna present. But the whole purpose of this webinar is to give you fodder in the form of a movie that you can present to your board to help them understand the risks that they face because we have customers giving us information and they're trusting us with this information. Uh, Bill 2K, um, uh, uh, Margaret, the target, um, and even the customers that do want to protect themselves or do know how to protect themselves are trusting the people uh, in our banks with very important information, with access to their cash that's into your you know, accounts over the internet, et cetera, et cetera. And so all these people have been working really hard to protect our customers against this guy right here, hacker guy, the proverbial, you know, jerk, the uh, the person who wants to cause harm to Margaret the Target of all people. And so what I want you to know is that we've been doing a good job. Uh, this is a, a rundown, um, kind of the cusp of the 2021 Verizon Data Breach and Incident Response Report. And it was published in the middle of 2021, and it looked at data breaches in the year 2020, you know, the year of the pandemic. And look at this, small financial institutions account for less than 1% of all the data breached in 2020. We are doing a good job. And I would like to introduce you to one of our up and coming speakers, Adam Reynolds, our lead non-technical auditor, meaning that he's knee deep in risk and he will be talking about the top seven risks that bank information security officers are struggling with in the coming year. Wow, Dan, thanks for that introduction. <laughs> really appreciate this opportunity to talk to board members throughout the Midwest about the top seven risks that small community-based financial institutions face. Because like Dan said, our customers are giving us this information and they're trusting us to protect that information. And so what I really want to go over today really is the board's role in protecting that information and then the top seven risks that smaller financial institutions face in 2022. 
and then I'll talk a little bit about how the board can help us manage those risks. The good news is that we're bankers, and we're in the business of banking, and we're good at managing risks. And that's the reason why, as Dan said, we accounted for less than 1% of the breaches during the middle of a pandemic, when a lot of us were still learning how to work from our homes. Dan always likes to use this metaphor of the canary in the coal mine, and so for at least the first time I'm doing this, I'm going to continue with that same metaphor. And for those of you who might not understand what we're talking about is, you know, back in the day, we didn't have the technology to detect what kind of chemicals were in the air. And in a coal mine, if methane gas ended up in the air, it could cause people to get sick or worse, we could blow up the whole mine. And so the whole control that coal miners would put into the place uh, was a canary in a nice little cage, and they'd locate these in, you know, appropriate places of the coal mine, and then they would make sure that all the coal miners were continuously looking for that sick bird. You know, and if we saw a sick bird, that was our cue to get the heck out of the place. And so this metaphor translates in terms of today's agenda. If you remember, we want to talk about the board's role and the top seven risks, and then how we can mitigate those risks. And so what we're really saying from this metaphorical perspective is we want to know, are we checking those birds? Now, the board's role really is, you know, with everything we've gone through and all the expense that banks go through and credit unions, you know, to put on the table in order to manage the risks, you know, are we checking those birds? Are we following through? Are we getting lost or, you know, perhaps distracted? And so the board's primary role really is to make sure that we're using those controls. We're using a set of controls that we put into place. The second part of the agenda then, the top seven risks from 2022, you know, from that metaphor's perspective, can be what will make our birds sick in 2022, right? What's going to cause our birds to be sick in 2022? And then how can the board ensure that we are protecting our customers? Well, they need to recognize that their role is to ensure that we're checking those birds. And so asking questions to make sure that we are checking those birds is an important way that the board can help us manage risk. Hey Adam, I know I'm supposed to do this next part, but can you take it? My system's frozen. Okay, would you like me to take this next section then? You know, when Dan first founded Infotex, there was really no guidance in the year 2000 for banks to manage technology risk. And so what he would present to the boards, and the first time he did this was in the year 2000, he would go in and he'd talk to the board about what we call CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And then he would say, hey, this is what you need to put into place to make sure that these controls are in place. And it was very far from today's standards, uh, kind of rudimentary. And it didn't take us long to realize, hey, you know, this is a bank and there's going to be all kinds of legal and compliance risk as well. And they're going to need to audit for that risk. And more important, you know, this is a bank or credit union and they trade on their reputation. So even though CIA was the best practice in the year 2000, banks quickly realized that it was more than about just CIA. It was about complying with the FFIEC's guidance, which there was hardly any at all back then, and it was about protecting our reputation. And by the way, back in those days, we didn't really need to talk about tabletop tests, uh, but we still make the case that the most important thing you can do to protect your reputation is to ensure that we're testing how we would respond if we screw up on any of these areas here. And so we call those incident response tabletop tests, and it is what we call the one control at Infotex. You know, it's the one control that will cure most of the problems that a bank has because it really establishes awareness. And we'll be talking about that uh, in a few more minutes, but what I also want you to know is we also realized really quickly that, you know, this is all fine and dandy, but what the board's role really is beyond this, the details of CIA and legal and compliance and reputational risk is to make sure that we're always remembering the reason we're a financial institution is because we protect our customers. I mean, this has been the case for hundreds of years. People put their money in a bank or credit union because they want to protect it. Now, in the year 2006, the FFIEC was very forward-looking. They released their first big guidance, the Information Security Handbook, it was called. And we kind of took to summarizing that for boards of directors to help them understand, hey, it mentions board awareness in this guidance. Uh, it was only a few times, but when it mentioned the board, there were some pretty important roles that the board had to complete. And we kind of learned that the best way to help the board understand that is that you have two primary responsibilities. 
you need to look backwards, uh, look at vendor risk reports, IT audit reports, and the annual report to the board, um, all of this annually, of course. But then also the board needs to look forwards in terms of approving policies and making sure that we are seeing risk assessments. Before we take the risk, uh, approving new technologies and of course approving the audit plan and key controls. And Dan always admits that you know, the audit plan you know is great for us. To see that in the guidance because you know until 2006, believe it or not, banks didn't audit their IT programs. But guess what? We didn't take very long to realize that, hey, maybe somebody on the board should understand all of those details. But as a whole, the board needs to always remember that the way to simplify the guidance is just to recognize that our job is to make sure that the management team is implementing the controls that need to be implemented to protect their customers. Now fast forward nine years. It took nine years for the next real earth-shaking guidance to be published. And you know, don't get me wrong, they published a lot of guidance between 2006 and 2015. If you remember, the FFIEC said nothing was new in their guidance, but the way they were interpreting it certainly put a lot of new controls on the plate. And what the board's role was, was to develop and maintain and approve on a regular basis their risk appetite statement. You know, when it comes to information security and cybersecurity, and the guidance says cybersecurity, but we see, you know, it really being the big picture of technology risk, how much risk do we want to take? Because we're collecting information and we're using technology to process that information. But guess what? You know, I know you know where this is probably going to go. Uh, but that was all fine and dandy, but we ended up telling the boards that, hey, you know, that there's lots of details in that guidance. There were 494 different controls we had to check for. Uh, but what the board needed to understand is that it really is about making sure that when we get those controls into place, we're maintaining them. We're checking on those sick birds and we're making sure that we're protecting our customers. Now in 2021, they updated the operations booklet that was published in 2004. Uh, and they did that with the new guidance, the Architecture, Infrastructure, and Operations Booklet uh, that mentions the Board or Steering Committee 54 different times. And that came out in 2021, and it is very detailed. It's, uh, it's really the tool that we'll be able to use to manage strategic risk. But once again, we're left walking into board meetings and saying, hey, this is great. Somebody on the board needs to get their arms around this, uh, what the management team is going to have to go through to come up to speed with this guidance. But really, what it's all about, once again, is making sure we're protecting our customers. Are we checking those birds now? We go into board meetings on a regular basis and present audit reports, and we present usually a scaled-down version of this webinar that you're watching today. And on a very regular basis, board members will pull us to the side, or they'll even bring up right in the meeting because we're encouraging them to ask questions. And so they'll say, well, you know, i got a question for you, protecting our customers. Can you give us some bullet points or something on how the board can make sure that we're protecting our customers? And you do that by asking questions, you know? Question them birds, right? But there's three areas that you really could focus your questions on. A, were we ready for the audit? Or when the audit comes in, you know, was our team ready for the audit? Did it look like they were just making this up as they went? Or did they have everything ready for us? Audit readiness, we've learned over the years, uh, as we watch organizations that do well versus organizations that don't, is really that simple. The organizations that don't have the breaches are the ones that are ready for our audits. Meanwhile, the reason they're ready for the audits is because awareness training was applied in all directions, not just uh, at our users, which is part of guidance, but we made sure the management team understood what needed to go into being ready for the audit, which is all about technology risk management. And so awareness training is huge. If you're just doing one you know, awareness training event a year and you're thinking you're done, you kind of missed the boat on that. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. And then finally, are we managing our new risks? You know, what questions can we ask? Usually when the board's brought into something, it's because there's probably a new risk we're gonna have to manage. Even if they don't present it that way, you know, if they say there's a new cool and great software that we wanna bring in and it's not that expensive, the board could ask, you know, it's not that expensive from a cash perspective, but how much is it going to cost us in terms of everybody's time to manage that new risk? So back to the whole concept of this agenda, the best way to manage risk right is to first start off knowing what we're gonna manage. And so what can make the canary sick in 2022 is what we're gonna be talking about next. 
Adam, you really helped us understand what the board's role is, and and boy, I, I'd like to second it. It's really about reminding the management team that the reason we're a financial institution is because unlike all those fintech people, we protect our customers. And so, as Adam was saying, part of that is making sure that we're managing the new risk properly, or, you know, what can make the bird sick in 2022. So... Adam, what can make the canary sick in 2022? Well, thank you, Dan. I'll be honest with you. There's a lot that can make them sick in 2022. And we've been keeping a list of the top seven risks for years and years. I think, you know, since you know, way back in the ancient times when Dan was auditing banks and that sort of thing, he'd write an article about the top seven risks once a year and so I'd like to just kind of bring up the 2021 top seven risks were huge. And, you know, a big one was fatigue. And the Verizon data breach report in 2021 is probably going to look, you know, just as good as it did in 2020, even though we had a lot of fatigue. So the board should really congratulate their team members for getting through 2021. Uh, 2022, unfortunately, is introducing a lot of risks that are really difficult to manage and get our arms around. So what's happened is once a year, Dan will pull a team and ask them to come up with the top 12 risks. And we develop this list of the top 12 risks that smaller community-based financial institutions will be facing in the coming year. And then we vote on them. And the seven risks that win the most votes are the risks that we present to the boards uh, the rest of the following year. So as you can see, users will still make mistakes cloud deployment we've already had on this list. Uh, and then another new risk is the malicious insider threat. And what's really frightening to me as an auditor is that this is becoming an important risk to manage. And the smaller the bank uh, is, it seems, the less they want to talk about it. And we understand why. But the board might need to make sure that we're at least becoming aware of how insider threats can materialize. We trust each other, uh, especially the smaller the bank, the more we trust each other. We've known you know, each other for years, but we'll talk about why trust is not a control. So users and vendors will still make mistakes. And I know that some of you might be thinking, well, if you expect them to make mistakes, they're going to. And so we used to say may, but you know, what they do, even the best of them, you know, 70% of the incidents that were experienced in the year 2020 were caused by users making mistakes. So we can't just pretend like that's gone away. It's usually because they've gone to the wrong page or because they've given out the wrong information on the phone. But, you know, fortunately in banks, it's less and less uh, than it is in other organizations, uh, but it's still a huge vulnerability. Meanwhile, you know, when Fiserv has a breach, well, you know, everybody can blame the big bad guy. But if it's a cleaning company that's from our local community or an IT guy from our local community that we've hired, for some reason, our customers won't be as forgiving. Uh, Infotex is an Indiana-based company, and we feel like it applies to us, too, that if there's a breach and it was caused by one of those multinational companies that will watch networks, your customers might be more forgiving than if it's a local vendor like Infotex. You know, they're going to be like, why were you working with that local vendor? And, you know, we're hoping we can arm you with the answers to that, and especially because... We don't want to make those mistakes, but we may make those mistakes. Really, we will make those mistakes. I know Dan would agree with that. Vendors still make mistakes. We have to, uh, as much as we hate it, you know, we have to make sure that we're getting our arms around the risk that our vendors expose us to. No vendor is the same, and many vendors are not doing as much as they should be to protect themselves. You know, if you're working with the fintech vendors, uh, the reason why they're fintech men, among many other reasons, um, they're not as heavily regulated as banks are. They're introducing risks that we've spent a lot of money to mitigate. Meanwhile, you know, we were forgiven for Equifax. Uh, they really helped us by acting terribly, but it's important that we recognize we've got to find ways to make sure that our local vendors are standing up to controls, you know, the same controls that a bank needs to stand up. You know, can they afford it? That's a big question we need to make sure uh, we're asking and answering. You know, maybe we can help them. 
but we also might be making mistakes at the bank. And I mean, you know, we've gone over uh, again and again uh, and again all the mistakes. And I mean, there's thousands of mistakes that users can make in a bank. Um, you know, there are mistakes we're seeing as we audit banks, you know, that, you know, this one-time password fatigue as we're all using multi-factor authentication to get into cloud sites to the point now where people are kind of ignoring them. And they're just saying, you know, yeah, 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 because they're used to pressing accept or authorize or approve or, you know, however the one-time password is asking to commit to that multi-factor authentication. You know, if we're just going ahead and accepting it every single time, then we're missing a big value, you know, on that control. And then we already talked about error fatigue in the previous years, but what we're talking about there is the fact that, you know, if every time we log in, you know, we close out of the same error message, we're going to stop reading the error messages. We might close out of an important error message that says, hey, there's something suspicious here or, you know, something like that. And don't get me wrong, error messages don't, you know, come up like that. But error messages are often what lets us realize, you know, there's a problem, you know, there's an error, right? And so we're just so used to, you know, Xing out of that error message that nobody's really doing anything with those messages anymore. The second big risk that we're facing in 2022 uh, is that supply chain cyber risk I was talking about. And so suffice it to say, I'm not going to board members with the details that, you know, uh, us IT auditors are really interested in, but, you know, there were more or far more than five incidents in 2021, but, you know, you've probably heard of these incidents because they were so, you know, earth shaking and scary, you know, not every vendor is the same. You know, some vendors did a really good job of notifying us and I'm not going to point to any one vendor in particular, you know, but one of the vendors on this list, you know, waited six months. They didn't even notify anybody until after one of their vendors realized that they had a vulnerability that was allowing people into a lot of networks, including some dank, uh, bank networks, you know, this particular vendor, um, you know, is an open source application. So it's more of an open source vendor. And, you know, there really is no vendor in that case, you know, in the case of Java, uh, and a lot of banks are using vendors that are using Java. You know, so this is what we mean by supply chain risk. And your management team is kind of groaning uh, daily about it, uh, something that we call vendor management. And unfortunately, the way we mitigate supply chain risk is with even more vendor management. And so there's a couple takeaways that you don't need to understand as a board member, but it's going to be heavy lifting. Um, you know, to stop, uh, suffice it to say, your team's already looking at the assurance documents, you know, the audit reports from their vendors. You know, there's two more things they're going to need to do when they're looking at them. Uh, audit reports and vendor management really is about 80% of the time spent managing risk in a bank. You know, so to think about that, we're adding something that's already very cumbersome but we're trying to find better ways to know your vendor. Now, just so you know, this doesn't age me, it ages Dan. Um, I'm not from the 70s, uh, a little bit after that, uh, but Dan loves this slide, so I left it in here. But it really is like a dating game. Uh, there needs to be you know, the same questions asked of all of our vendors so that we can sort the vendors that are safe from the vendors that are not. And true, there's a lot of vendors that we simply have no choice over. We're not going to change our core because it had a bad audit report, but we can still use that bad audit report the next time it's time to negotiate with that core. Uh, the people in banking, you know, are just burdened with compliance anyway. And what we worry about as auditors is that they're focused on the compliance, you know, that makes them money, you know, loan review, that sort of thing at the expense of the compliance activities that cost us money. And a lot of security controls cost us money. Vendor management costs a lot in terms of time. You know, we're hoping that the board is asking their management team, are you finding enough time to manage vendor risk? You know, if not, what can we do about that? You know, how can the board help them manage vendor risk? The third big risk of 2022 is the attacks on our customers. And hopefully this doesn't look foreign to you. You know, if it does, then maybe you don't own your own business or, you know, I don't know. But suffice it to say, board members should already understand uh, what a corporate takeout is. Uh, corporate account takeover is. It's, you know, when somebody sees one of your customer accounts uh, and uses it to drain all the cash out of their bank. Uh, a personal account takeover is the same as a corporate account takeover, but it's not on a retail account, uh, not on a commercial account, right? Uh, and then, of course, business email compromise. Uh, usually on a corporation, it's usually, you know, appearing like the CFO is asking somebody to wire money to somebody else. And that somebody else uh, just might happen to be what we call a mule, somebody that's you know in the business of taking money wired to them, 
as part of a breach and transferring that into Bitcoin or some other method that makes it easier to be able to make that money usable. And then, of course, if you haven't heard of ransomware by now, um, you know you must uh, be living under a rock because you know that's nothing that's new. Um, Shadow IT is kind of new though, um, and it's kind of not. We introduced it as a vulnerability, but we've been talking about it since we first started talking about vendor management in 2006, um, when that information security handbook charged us with the task of managing the vendors. You know, what are the risks that our vendors are exposing us to, and you know, but what Shadow IT is, we used to call it IT Rogue Technology Acquisitions, uh, when technology is brought into the information system without following the proper channels, and that can give us a lot of trouble. You know, we're going to talk about cloud deployment risk. Uh, that's really Shadow IT sometimes, where management teams are entering into agreements with vendors that you know aren't even technology vendors but they need us to go to a particular portal or whatever to do business. You know, that portal represents data leaving the network. We need to manage that particular vendor. And so a lot of times with applications, you know, I mean, we might have good intentions, but we're introducing risk to the bank that isn't being managed. Uh, you know, the Internet of Things is really causing a lot more um, good intentioned shadow IT where there's, you know, devices on our network that actually use data and we don't realize it or they're connected to the internet, you know, we don't realize it. Any connection to the internet is an opportunity for a bad actor to breach our network. And it's the malicious shadow IT that is the most frightening. So the concept of an advanced persistent threat is one that as a board member, you might want to ask your IT people about. If they're not fully understanding what is meant by an advanced persistent threat or APT, you know, just by you asking them about it, you know, of course, they'll get their arms around it. And, you know, this goes back to how the board can help. You know, insiders, we're going to be talking about a little bit. Um, but the advanced persistent threats really, again, is what's scary to us, you know, is that it takes advantage of all the different things that we've been talking about for the last 22 years here at Infotex, you know, especially the most recent things. And so, you know, if you're on the network, the advanced persistent threat is somebody that's, you know, luckily, usually because of automated tools and the like are blocked. But, you know, in a bank, it's because the stars and the moon were aligned correctly and somebody made a mistake. But, you know, they now have access to your network. You know, they realize if they just start, you know, transferring data or whatever, that that access will be detected and they'll be kicked off the network. So they're over the course of months and months implementing a very slow motion attack. And, you know, here's some examples of the non-malicious shadow IT. You know, the, we've seen that uh, rocket books, uh, a neat little thing where you write notes into a book and then you press a button and it converts those notes into a nice little, you know, text that you can put into an email or document in a file or whatever. They're, you know, pretty cool. But, you know, where do those notes go? When you press that button, they go to the cloud, meaning that we don't have any control over that. And if we're taking notes in a meeting and we're in a bank, you know, there's a very good chance there's confidential information in those notes, right? And that's an example of how we can end up with non-malicious shadow IT. You know, worse, of course, is the malicious shadow IT. And, you know, there's a lot of different apps that once an APT um, has access to the bank's network, they're going to try to download to that bank's network so that, you know, they can, over time, use those tools to find a way to exfiltrate data or to find a way to get ransomware on the network. You know, banks have control after control after control, layer after layer after layer of security. But we're scared to death of the APT, especially if somebody can work, you know, with a banker and that person ends up being a bad actor. You know, cloud sites without multi-factor authentication are a good example of the types of sites that somebody might use to upload data that doesn't belong to them. So we really need to focus in on cloud sites that are legitimate so that the people that are monitoring our network can tell the difference between legitimate and illegitimate traffic. So the way we control shadow IT is with awareness training, not only for the non-malicious, but also for the malicious threats. You know, we need to know that, hey, you know, if your mouse moved and you didn't have your hand on the mouse, or I guess I should say if your cursor moved and you didn't have your hand on the mouse, you know, you better report that to somebody. You know, that could be an example of shadow IT, an advanced persistent threat trying to take control or actually has control of your section uh, session. But, you know, you know, network inventories, vulnerability management, you know, the, the real big control for shadow IT is the security information event management system uh, that most banks have in place or you know they're outsourcing usually to a company like Infotex and of course spoiler alert uh, Infotex is a, a SIEM provider 
and our system is always looking for the actions of an APT. Uh, you, you know, we can see that somebody's scanning somebody else. You know, now that of course happens a lot. You know, but that looks legitimate, and we can take that information back to the IT people if it wasn't them. You know, now we know, hey, we better take a closer look at what happened here. You know, why is there scanning in the middle of the night? You know, no one was trying to troubleshoot or manage vulnerabilities. And then, of course, you know, we can use data loss prevention because ultimately shadow IT people on the malicious side, they're going to try to do two things. You know, they're going to try to, you know, if they're smart, try to exfiltrate data. And then they're going to bribe the bank, you know, possibly with ransomware. And I was a little disappointed with the AIO booklet um, that was not uh, or was in the top 12 risks, but the team did not elect it to be in the top seven. Uh, I'm an auditor, and as you know, us auditors like to make sure our clients are aware of the new guidance that we're going to be auditing them against. Uh, and so I decided to use Shadow IT, which is covered in the AIO booklet. And you know, that's why we're saying it's new, uh, but it's not a new concept. It's because the FFIEC is finally starting to give us guidance on how they want to, uh, us to address shadow IT. And so this is my opportunity to talk to board members about the fact that on June 30th, 2021, the FFIEC published a guidance that, you know, really is wise in the grand scheme of things. And it should be have uh, been published, you know, maybe five or so years ago, but it'll really help us manage a lot of different risks, uh, including strategic risk and shadow IT. And the reason I want to put this on the board's radar is because this is not a guidance that's going to be easy to come into compliance with. And you'll be approving uh, a new policy, or there could be language added to an existing policy, or again, you know, it might be a standalone policy, but it will require what's called an architecture plan. Most community-based banks do their technology plans one year at a time, and this is really asking us to look five years down the road, which right now is an ideal time to do because that uh, guidance, uh, AIO, Architecture Infrastructure Operations, uh, you know, we've been abbreviating that. Hope you've realized that by now. But it's asking us to have a paradigm shift and work towards what's called zero trust. And that's not going to happen in a year. You know, it's going to happen over the course of three, four, five, maybe even six years. And really, it's going to take a lot of patience and teamwork to comply with that new AIO guidance. Now, I said I was disappointed that the new guidance didn't make it into the top seven. Uh, but what you need to realize is the reason for that is because they're the top seven risks that, let me say they're real risks, they're scary, and they're not about getting your hand slapped as you're not in compliance with the new guidance. They're about bad actors knowing how to get into bank networks even now in 2022. And the main way they're doing that is, you know, they're really using the great grandchildren of malware. You know, malware has always been scary, but it's also always advancing in sophistication. It's, it's set up to facilitate orchestrated attacks that are targeting smaller financial institutions. And, you know, right now we're kind of benefiting from the fact that most industries in America are not, you know, really cyber safe. They're kind of behind the game, but eventually everybody's going to come up to speed. And then, you know, who do you think they're going to circle back around to and start attacking on a regular basis? And, and I'm not saying the reason, you know, why we're less than a half percent of the breaches in 2020 is because, you know, there was low hanging fruit elsewhere. But we are where the money is, right? Um, I think it was Willie Horton that said, you know, I break into banks because that's where the money is. You know, once it becomes less and less likely for us to be able to bribe schools or Fortune 500 companies or, you know, when I say us, I don't mean, you know, the good guys, but the ransomware actors, they're eventually going to say, you know, all right, back to what we were doing, you know, before this other lucrative business of the schools and the Fortune 500 uh, companies, you know, they're going to start attacking banks again. And so... We have this kind of nice, you know, period of time here where we need to start becoming aware of the new tools that are being used to attack us. We haven't been attacked as heavily in the last three or four years because of ransomware, you know, but when that goes away, when those other sources go away, uh, they're going to start attacking us again. And they're going to be using open source intelligence tools. They're going to be you know, able to find information about us bankers that we may not want our peers to know, and they can use that to bribe us. And they're going to be using the self-aware ransomware that might find its way on the network in ways we can't even predict. You know, there are now toolkits that you can use as an advanced persistent threat to perform reconnaissance on a network without anybody's noticing it's there. There is what we call fileless uh, malware, where malware ends up on your network because nobody really did anything. It ended up there because you went to a website that had it on the site. 
password spraying where, you know, websites and companies that have been previously breached, uh, usernames and passwords are on the dark web. That information is out there. And if users are reusing passwords from other sites or applications, the bad actors can grab that information and try it in a whole bunch of different places automatically. You know, they can log into every website that it would, you know, take for you in an evening to crawl. Uh, they can do that with an automated process that just takes, you know, minutes. And then they're attacking our phones now. I don't know why we thought we'd be able to escape that, but even the Apple phones are far less secure in 2022 than they were five years ago in 2017. And that's not only because the user base has grown, but because the threats are becoming much more sophisticated and automated as well. Now, you might be wondering what this metaphorical diagram is, or that's what Dan calls them, uh, what it's trying to represent here. And it can represent a whole lot, of course. I mean, you might just think that it represents vendor management after what we've said, you know, and it really could. Uh, but suffice it to say, what it really represents, what we're seeing it representing, is the continuous nature of information security, that it's cyclical, and that you can never cross it off the list. But, you know, when we show this to IT people, you know, Every single one of them almost you know, comes back saying that this represents patch management. And so we put it up here just to say, hey, you know, what does this mean to you? Well, that's patch management is what we hear back a lot. And if you think about it, it's because of the fact that patch management has become this monthly cycle that is a lot of work. There's a lot of details. It's stuff you have to learn only once and then you never have to know it again. So it's almost maddening and it addresses the fact that unlike banks, you know, who have to go to market with something that works, most application vendors are rushing their applications to market you know, with all kinds of bugs and vulnerabilities and such in it. And so, you know, being an IT person is like having a new car that is having a recall on a monthly basis. And it's not just because one part was broke. It's because there are, you know, tens, hundreds of parts uh, that need fixed on the car. And, you know, guess what? You don't get to take it uh, somewhere for the, have someone else fix it. You have to fix it yourself. And I mean, it's just getting really maddening. So, you know, we talk about vulnerability management, uh, which is kind of the next generation patch management. It's a different approach to patch management. And I want to make sure you know uh, that, you know, but vulnerability management is not going to solve everything. It's not going to make us completely safe and secure, but it's going to help us be more safe and secure. You know, when Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid come out of here, you know, they're not going home or anywhere. It's, it's over for them. So it's not like we're really winning the war just because we're switching to vulnerability management. We're just keeping the risk properly managed. It's never going to go completely away. And so the cusp of what makes vulnerability management different than patch management is two things. A, we're going to take a prioritized approach, and I'm going to circle back around to that uh, with the next slide. But suffice it to say that you know, until we start preaching vulnerability management, Everything had to be patched on, you know, every month, and it's just almost impossible. And so we want to patch on a prioritized basis. We want to patch the critical vulnerabilities first, then the high risk vulnerabilities and the moderate risk, and then then the low risk and, you know, really take a more prioritized approach towards patch management. You know, but we're going to be running our own scans. Uh, it used to be our auditors came in once, you know, a year, scanned the network and told us where our patch management wasn't working. But now we're going to do our own testing. And you know, after every time we implement patches on a regular basis, you know, each bank is, of course, coming up with their own testing regime. But suffice it to say, senior management needs to understand that we're doing this test to make sure that the high and critical risk vulnerabilities are being patched. We might not be so worried about the moderate risk or even low risk vulnerabilities until those other ones are taken care of, which takes me back to that prioritized approach. You know, suffice to say, we will never escape death. You know, we're never going to. Uh, I know some of you are thinking that maybe someday we'll escape taxes. But no, you know, I mean, until we die, we're never even going to escape, you know, low risk findings on a vulnerability report. That if a vulnerability report comes in from your auditors, you know, and it has low risk findings on it. Great. Because there were no critical, high or moderate risk findings on that report. There is a movie available that Stan's done for vulnerability management for directors if you want to drill down on that subject.
The sixth biggest risk that we face is our customers are giving us information and we're using technology to process it in 2022 is the notion that we have cloud deployments without multi-factor authentication. What do I mean by that? You know, we can log into sites that have information our customers are trusting us with, you know, with just a username and a password. It's like telling people you don't need to use a debit card at the ATM, you know, just use your PIN, right? The reason why we only have a four digit PIN is because we are required to use two factor authentication at the ATM machine. Well, automatic teller machine, ATM machine is a a little redundant. The first factor being the PIN and the second factor being the card. It's what you know, the PIN, and what you have, the card. You know, those two combined together substantially decrease the likelihood that somebody's going to be able to spoof somebody else. And thus we give our customers access to cash with only a four-digit PIN because they have that two-factor authentication. And cloud computing offers a lot of great benefits. You know, we don't have to patch. We don't have to do vulnerability management. We don't have to test. We don't have to process the update, you know, but we're making sure that's all being done, you know, through vendor management, of course, but there are still risks with cloud security. We've lost control of our data. Somebody else is securing it for us. And, you know, we're banks. So any data, you know, probably has, you know, information we're supposed to be keeping confidential, you know, or why are we using it? And, you know, it's the way that we configure a cloud site that makes it secure. And that configuration needs to require authentication, multi-factor authentication or two-factor authentication at every point, not just at the login. And you know, if you're doing a really important transaction, a high-risk transaction, you know, something that you know, allows you to, say, buy a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of stock, you know, you ought to re-authenticate when you do that, right? there's really one thing that makes cloud computing safer than our networks. You know, unless we actually have two-factor authentication in our networks, and that's you know, the fact that most cl cloud sites are now offering two-factor authentication, and it substantially reduces the risk. And so you know, why wouldn't they? And so there's a lot of issues in the way we configure cloud computing. And so one of those uh, ways, is, as a board member you can help, is just to ask your auditor next time they come in, are you checking the way we configure multi-factor authentication? And here's why, you know, very often people think that they have multi-factor authentication in place, you know, at least the IT people do, but it broke somewhere along the way. And because we didn't have good awareness training, our management team didn't know to say, hey, when I'm not being required to give a one-time password every time I log into, you know, such and such site. And so we need to drill it into our management team. You know, if you're not using multi-factor authentication, then you shouldn't be on a cloud site. This monkey is trapped because he won't let go of the banana. And so we need to realize if you want to use the cloud, you have to be using more than one factor of authentication to get to the data on that cloud. And we really need to make sure management understands that so that they're not accidentally adding to the shadow IT that we're trying to prevent the bank from using. Now, when I'm, you know, in person, I know when Dan's in person, this slide probably works a little bit better because we're used to talking to community-based banks where there's almost like a tension in the room when you start talking about the fact that this guy over here, I don't know if you met him, uh, we talked to Margaret the Target and Bill 2K, their customers, not even members of the bank. And you know Mark Edding and you know Joe and Jane Isaac right, but who's this guy? Well, he's the new guy and he could be a bad actor and just so you know, it's it's not just the new guy that could be the bad actor. Uh, we might have made personnel mad, or personnel might be in a bad situation at home, or might have suffered from open source intelligence where somebody on the internet found out something about them that they don't want their peers to know. And all they have to do is just give this one little password to this one little place, and that person won't tell everybody uh, what you know. personnel doesn't want them to know. And so this is what we call the malicious insider threat. We're not talking about, you know, the viewpoint, you know, that a lot of people think of when we talk about the insider threat, which is people making mistakes, you know. We've already talked about users will, you know, not may make mistakes, you know. What we're talking about here is that the uh, malicious insider threat is real. It's real and most banks kind of tense up because they want to trust their employees. And I get that. But as a board member, you need to realize that people can go bad or can go rogue. And so really what's causing the concern you know, for auditors isn't as, uh, as much that we think that you have bad people in your bank. 
It's that you're not ready in case that you do. Um, and we really need to make sure that, you know, if we actually do end up with a bad actor on our network, we can react to that in a manner that's not going to hurt the bank's reputation. You know, 85% of breaches include the human element, right? And let's face it, there's far more breaches because users made mistakes. Legitimate users trying to do their job, good people, you know, made mistakes. But boy, the impact of an insider breach, especially in the smallest of community banks, is huge. It's a black swan impact. I mean, think about it. If somebody came in and shot up your bank, hate to say that, you know, but if they did, you know, we'd all recognize that's a huge impact. Our customers aren't going to feel safe in there anymore. But what if we get caught or somebody gets caught defrauding a customer or if somebody helps someone transfer all the data out and that becomes known? Our customers really, you know, would they forgive us if we hired somebody who hurt them? And so what does the insider threat have in common? Well, A, you know, we've caught insider threats in our history at Infotex. And what I always noticed is that everybody would say, well, we should have realized something was wrong when blah, blah, blah. Well, why didn't you say anything? There's people that could have watched that insider. We also, you know, can see the signs of an insider threat in the network traffic if we know what to look for. Um, keep in mind that most insiders, you know, will look like legitimate traffic. And, you know, I mean, uh, it'll never happen here is the reason why we're concerned. And yet we usually hear this, you know, when we hear there's a breach. So this is causing you know, nobody to do anything about the insider threat. Uh, the FFIC, by the way, refers to the insider threat as rogue employees. And I like that because it implies that an employee is going to go rogue. And that's what we have to realize is that, you know, if somebody's in trouble at home, if somebody's got a financial hardship, you know, if they're seeing ways to make money off selling data or whatever, and they're feeling like no one's watching, you know, the way we bring it up with our clients now is, hey, you know, what would you do if I just snapped today <laughs> when I had access to all this information on your network? What would you do if an insider, you know, which could be a vendor, or even an IT auditor, you know, what if somebody just snapped? Of course, you know, the thing that scares us the most is, is this. And this is what causes people to say that it'll never happen here. And so, you know, I might even grant you that. Hey, the best of community-based banks, the reason why they're the best is because they're really good at bringing in good people. But those good people could still just snap or they could get into financial trouble, right? So, you know, there's good reasons for people to go rogue, I guess. And that's really a likelihood issue. But the problem is, is that usually if somebody has access to your network, you know, as an insider, what they're doing uh, looks like legitimate traffic to a SIEM provider like Infotex. And it isn't until somebody, or it isn't until something does happen that it's like, well, why didn't you see that? Well, you know, it actually came from this. It was an internal user at your bank that screwed up all their data. Or that, you know, this stuff here is more of a, I'm going to blow everything up, I'm so mad. Uh, this is, I need the money, you know. This is, I can sell the data for money. And then this one right here is, you know, it's easy for an insider to get ransomware in a bank's network. And it's just scary as heck. So, you know, we have to do something about the insider threat. That's an impact type reason. But the main reason why, as a board member, I hope you're wise enough to bring up with the management team, you know, what are we doing about the insider threat, is that the impact is, you know, just a black swan. There's really you know, all that uh, there's to it. Uh, it's a black swan type impact. Dan, would you like to take it from here? Um, this is Dan here again, and, and Adam's now gonna kind of drill down on what the board can do to help the management team manage those risks. I have to say, Adam, you, you frightened me, not enlightened me, but I guess that's part of the process here, right? But really what we're talking about in this next section is you know, how do we question those birds? What kind of questions should we be asking? So, Adam? Well, thank you, Dan, and you're right. That's really what it all boils down to for the board is, you know, what kind of questions can we ask that helps our management team manage risk and helps our management team stay on top of the controls that we've put into place in order to manage that risk. 
And so, you know, I've already talked about audit readiness and awareness training and managing the new risks, you know, already discussed the ways that we can manage new risks. And really, you want to make sure that, you know, we're not talking uh, just about user awareness training, uh, but management and customer and even technical team uh, awareness training. If your technical people are not going to conferences on a regular basis, you know, they, you know, for one, they need time to step away from the network a little bit, you know, so they can come at it with a set of fresh eyes. But for two, you know, they need to learn about these new risks or else they're not going to be able to manage those new risks. And so beyond that, though, you know, we really could establish that the board should be asking, you know, if you interact with lower levels of your company, your tellers, your customer service representatives or whatever, ask them, do they feel comfortable reporting? If you just clicked on a link, would you feel comfortable going in and letting your supervisor know, hey, I just screwed up, I think, you know, I think I just clicked on this link because self-reporting is huge. It's very important part of awareness and if people are frightened to come in and report, you know, that they think that they just screwed up. Then, you know, if that was a breach, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse until somebody finally figures out that, hey, you know, we've been breached. So if somebody thinks they just got fished, they need to feel comfortable letting not only their supervisor know, but even, you know, up to the point where the whole bank needs to be informed, you know, to stay on top of this uh, threat. And we all make mistakes. Yeah, I'm going to repeat that again. We all make mistakes. But the self-reporting culture is a very important culture that banks should have. So a great question that the board could ask is, you know, do you feel comfortable reporting when you just screwed up? And this goes back to really user containment. You know, your users should know that when they grow suspicious, which includes, of course, self-reporting, you know, but your acceptable use policy should establish that the first thing they do is trying to contain that incident from going any further. And that would be by disconnecting the device from all networks. You know, back in the day, that just meant unplugging your workstation from the wall. Nowadays, it means going into airplane mode and letting your IT department know so that they can disconnect the session, you know, if it's on the virtual infrastructure. Now, management training to us, you know, really incident response testing is the one control that if you're doing a good job of tabletop testing your management team, well, you would know as a board member because you may have been included or at least, you know, one of the board members or maybe several of the board members would have been included in that incident response tabletop test. But board members have a lot to do with incident response. And if you don't know what your role is in an incident, you know, you should ask. And we already talked about the technical team going to conferences or, you know, some way, um, you know, are they getting certificates uh, and continuing education? You know, that's another way besides going to conferences. And it can be a lot less expensive than a conference, you know, to get a certificate in information security. But your vendors, you know, what are we doing to make sure our vendors, especially the smaller local vendors, are aware of the fact that we're a bank, you know, and our vendors are required, you know, we're expecting our vendors to step up to the plate from a cybersecurity perspective. And then what are we doing to let, you know, the customers know about the fact that, hey, you know, there's a lot of different ways that customers can be attacked these days. And when our customers are harmed, we're harmed as a bank. You know, not only that, but it could be used to attack the bank as well. The, the customers have access to the bank through their accounts. And then, of course, the easiest question is, you know, what are the new risks and how are we managing them? But suffice it to say, you know, here's just kind of a list of questions you could be asking your management team, you know, on a regular basis. Now, this right here would be a question for your auditor. Uh, I get asked this question a lot. Nobody minds, just so you know. And, you know, sometimes I have to say, you know, no, not really. So what are we doing to educate our customers? Again, going back to that, there's a lot of different things that can be done. If it's just relying on a website, uh, you know, to provide them information, you know, uh, the big banks, right? You know, we're small community-based banks for a reason. We're in the community. So let's educate our customers. You know, we are the experts at cybersecurity because though many people might say unfortunately, but fortunately we have been audited on a regular basis since at least 2006 and we only accounted for less than 1% of the breaches in 2020. So our customers see us naturally as experts at keeping that information safe. And then what are the new risks, you know? If you've watched this movie, you know, go back to your management team and say, okay, what did Dan have wrong or what did Adam have wrong? You know, what are the new risks and what are we doing about them? 
We just told you, you know, what the risks are, but we didn't tell you, you know, other than vulnerability management, what to do about them. And so I imagine hopefully that you have a lot of questions now for your management team and for your information technology people. And with that, back to you, Dan. Thank you very much, Adam. I'll have to say that uh, already you're, you're doing movies shorter than I was able to do them, so that's a good thing. And uh, I also felt like, uh, you know, I mean, you just really nailed it when it came to the ending of that, because let's face it, the questions that the board asks are going to be what drives our management team. And so if we're keeping those questions fo focused on how can we protect our customers, we will make sure that our management team does not forget to check them birds. So thank you, everybody. We appreciate your time.